Bithel, and I made, well, this, this game, uh, Thomas Was Alone. Thank you uh, for buying a copy, that's very kind of you, um, unless you've pirated it, in which case, please go and buy a copy. Um, it's in sales quite regularly, hopefully. It's weird speaking to you from the past. So, uh, this is Thomas. Uh, he is, well, he was named originally by the community. Um, the game's name, Thomas Was Alone, was, uh, it was arrived upon by a friend of mine who sarcastically suggested I should call So this this is step one, side-to-side -side movement. Um, if you're a platforming game fan, it should not present too much of a challenge to you. But here it's really just about easing the player into the way the world works. Seeing gravity for the first time, understanding how falling feels. And then actually kind of talking about that in the, in the voiceover to kind of have a bit of fun with it. It's also introduced jumping, um, had to be right. It's, it's kind of the main way you interact in this game, obviously. I did a lot of research, I got kind of obsessive about it, it took me, I was still fiddling with the jump physics I think about three weeks before I launched the game. This is a challenging jump, so this is a jump where the player can fail at it. So there's a gap, um, but the, the whole point of this level is to introduce the idea of jump distance and the fact that you can fall from a jump, but hopefully in kind of a safe environment. So, so here you can't be, you can't die, you can't lose, um, all you're going to do is, is keep doing it until you succeed. And it's kind of a little bit easier than it looks as well. So I played a lot of Uncharted um, <laughs> before making this level, um, and it really—it's kind of inspired by that kind of those kind of scripted moments in games. I didn't do as many in the game as I kind of expected to at the start. The kind of there's a few reasons for that, but I guess the main one was that once the player. So this is this is a subtle one, but it's kind of important. And I know I'm talking a lot about um, game design introduction. This is this is by the way, this isn't like innovative in any way. This is this is Mario. This is every game you ever played. But I think it's kind of interesting to go through the steps. So here, so here is the kind of, we're extrapolating on precision. Um, it's essentially, uh, we've done it in the previous level, we've, we've made you do it. Um, and here we're kind of queuing up a few of those. So if you fail at one, you can actually force yourself to go back a, a couple of steps in the, in the progress. This is kind of the first time we're challenging the player. Um, which is which is important, but it's it's important as well that it's not overwhelming. Um, it's still very early days. I haven't yet shown you the the kind of the differentiating mechanic of Thomas, so it's it's again just kind of bringing players up to speed with stuff and and starting to show them how a game would work in this space. respawning to the game until about a month before release. Um, <laughs> it's a classic example of something that every playtest I ever did. Um, so basically, if you if you died in the game uh, previous to, uh, to a month before it came out, you were basically reset the level. So it didn't matter how much progress you lighting. Um, it's a weird one, the lighting. I, I kind of, I, well, I didn't have lighting at one stage. There wasn't light. Um, then there was sounding a bit biblical. Um, but as it went on, I kind of added that in. Initially, I was doing them by hand for every level, um, and basically this procedural system kind of came out of well, laziness. I didn't want to do that anymore. And, and weirdly, as a side effect of that, I, um, it, it was cool, and the shadows moved and could be kind of um, related to placement of objects, placement of characters. And it was good. Um, it's actually faked because the game was made in uh, free Unity. I didn't have any uh, shadows within the game kind of proper. So what I did was these are... Okay, so this is the moving platform corridor. Um, this was uh, an attempt to bring in something that's going to become very important in a very short amount of time. Um, the moving platforms. It's really hard to introduce moving platforms because moving platforms move. <laughs> and that makes them challenging and makes them uh, a kind of a complex interaction. So what the corridor here allows me to do is introduce you to the idea that sometimes the ground moves, but in a way that doesn't actually kind of impact you too much and won't cause you, hopefully, to, to get too stressed out. People seem to like it. It's kind of a bouncy castle level. People tend to, to have fun as they move through it, which is quite cool. Um, and yeah, it's, it looks... This is the most important level in the game. Uh, this is the point where... I basically get to the point, <laughs> and arguably I should have done it a little bit sooner. However, this is where it is, and, and that's fine. 
Um, so this is the point where the player has to learn how to switch characters, which is kind of the basis of the entire thing, is this switching between the characters. It's This is also actually one of the first levels. This is almost identical to the version that was in the original Flash game. You have two characters, both on the wrong side with their alternating... This is uh, this was a weird little accident, this level, actually. There's on, the, uh, on Thomas on the right there... Uh, as you move up, uh, you're moving through uh, trigger boxes. If you don't, if you don't make games, trigger boxes are basically um, spaces you jump into or move into, and they cause something in the game to happen. So as you move up as Thomas, you're hitting these trigger boxes, which cause the um, the, the walls to come in. But as a really weird coincidence, I got one of the timings wrong. So that as you moved up, there's a certain point where it looks like you can jump somewhere. You jump to it, and the wall flies out and hits you in the face. Um, <laughs> it's kind of a funny moment. And I did it, and I thought it was I thought it was funny, and it felt kind of organic. And I took it to, um, when I started showing the game to people, it happened to everyone. It's a weird thing that it seems to catch everyone out. Even though there's nothing forcing you into it, you know, 90% of the time people get hit in the face. And most of the time they laugh. Um, so I left it in, and it's, I'm really happy with it, actually. It's, it's one of those nice little uh, coincidences that worked out really well. <laughs> Everyone loved the steps. Um, they didn't actually, and I—it's—it's it's probably my biggest uh, design regret in the game. Is steps uh, basically uh, are kind of obstacles that you have to jump over by kind of uh, piling up a few characters in order to get through. That's fine. The problem with steps is that you have to do that repeatedly. That you have to solve essentially solve the same puzzle over and over again in sequence. And there's just two or three too many times I do that in the whole game. Um, and it's frustrating to players. Um, yeah, it, it sucks. I, I went through and I removed quite a few of them. So if you're annoyed, <laughs> you would have been more annoyed if I'd left it how it was. Um, so yeah, it's 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 a shame. It's I, I think there's, there's some which are more acceptable than others. Um, but yeah, it's, if that's the worst bit of design in the game, I'm, I'm pretty happy though. So yeah. Lesson learned. a great example of um, how useful playtesting is. I this, ver this this map was always very similar to this, but there was one major kind of design difference was that the stepping stones at the bottom of the screen had a wall had had no wall below them, so they were floating over water, which meant that you could fail about about eight or nine times here, um, causing you to get very frustrated and angry. And it wasn't a soft fail where your character fell through and you got back up and carried on. It was a cruel, harsh fail that reset the level, um, and, and my playtesters hated it. So this is a, gr a great example of the kind of thing that, to me, was invisible because I understood how the characters moved and I was, you know, making them and playing them all the time. To me, it was a really easy sequence of stepping stones that you can get through first time every time. But once I put it in front of playtesters, I got emails from people saying it was taking them like 45 minutes to get through this level because of that that problem. So just sticking a wall underneath, I kept the water because it looked nice. But the sticking a wall underneath really kind of helped and just smoothed people through. People are still working out the game at this stage, and I don't want to kick them too much in the face. I've already hit them in the face. Danny really... Well, I should have mentioned Danny a little bit sooner. Um, he, he just does so much. Um, I, it's, a, it's a long, long story that I've told lots of places, but ba basically I wrote the story for him. I, I was um, trying to find a voice that would suit the game, and I was a big fan of his writing and, and his kind of audiobooks and... and radio stuff and all the things he does um and i wrote the part kind of with his voice in mind um and then i tried to find people who could do it and no one could do it um and then i got drunk and called and emailed him and he said yes uh which was a bit a bit of a shock um so i'm really chuffed he did an awesome job um he's he's been really cool with the game he's he's talked about it he's been lovely and he's just a really nice chap he's also really fast i'm recording this 
after recording some other stuff with Danny and he just he's amazingly quick at what he does I'm doing a much worse job and the, uh, the, the people in the booth are getting bored I imagine at this point <laughs> John's my favourite character. Well, I do. I'm going to say that a few times. Cause I've got quite a few favourite characters, but John, John, I really in particular like. He's um, he's insecure um, in uh, in a weird way. I'm not entirely sure why he is, but he is, um, and that leads him to kind of be dishonest and narcissistic, um, which I think a large, large number of uh, creative people will, will will associate with. I know I do. Um, and he's um, yeah. So he's he's a really interesting character. I like the way he grows. I like that his journey as he goes on, um, and I like the way that his power of kind of basically being the highest jumper is usurped later on by Sarah, and, and what that does to his view on uh, on his situation. So he's a very cool character. is another level actually from the original Flash game uh, which obviously I tweaked and kind of brought across. I really liked the idea of confined spaces um, as applied to this game because with, with um, large spaces having multiple characters with different abilities kind of hopefully feels kind of empowering, feels like you can you know, do anything and get anywhere. Putting them into a confined space kind of becomes an interesting kind of jumble you kind of they get in each other's way they trip over each other there's a nice little bit of narration here that kind of highlights that stuff but it was just something really cool. this level exists solely to allow the player to feel their way into john um this is this is a chance for you to basically make him jump properly for the first time and hopefully because of the, the constraints in the last level that feels awesome um and i actually use the word awesome in the narration to just just to push you in case that's not how you're feeling um you should it's a very good game um, and then, yeah, so you, you've now got access to this awesome jump, and you can, uh, you can, you can do what you feel. John decided to press the switch to let the little dots catch up with him. 
John cared for his new allies. You could tell from the sympathetic expression he'd practiced in the mirror all these years. This is getting very self-deprecating, but I think this is the weakest level in the game. Um, I came very, very close to cutting it. This is where the, the staircase repetition kind of becomes, well, boring. Um, <laughs> um, I did do a lot. I shifted things around, um, uh, kind of varied the step sizes and gaps and to add variety, but but it's, it's, it's a lot better than it was, but it was not... It's, it's the one that when I'm watching Let's Plays, and I'll talk a bit more about Let's Plays in a bit, but the... The, the way I, yeah, it's kind of the one that I fast forward through on the Let's Plays because I find it very, very slow. I don't know, it, that might just be over familiarity, but um, I, I don't like this level. Um, have fun with it though, and, and I'll see you on the next one.
so much either. The red one, Thomas, had a charming way of applauding every time John jumped. immediately likeable, but his unremitting cynicism and tutting amused John. This is the last, this is actually the last level of the demo, um, so it's kind of important for that reason. Um, but the, the kind of the big design lesson here, and you'll notice, I, don't, I, I guess like the, 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 the lessons are slowing down at this point, um, but the, the big lesson here is that there's a temporary portal success. So previously all the portals have sat on a static ground, so you queue someone up, you queue someone up, you queue someone up. With this one, you have to finish this level by having Thomas falling through that portal. Um, and it's, again, it's hopefully it's kind of safe. If you if you miss your timing or you get him through early, you can always catch back up with yourself. So it, it doesn't punish you if you don't get it immediately. But it's something I really wanted to do later on. And there's quite a few places where I I play with this idea. Um, so, yeah, it's that basically. It's a, it's a way of introducing that and hopefully kind of hints at the possibilities if you're playing the demo of kind of where the game can continue on, on from there.
is all about the setup. To to buy the fact that she actually thinks that swimming is a superpower, you kind of have to set her up before that as as feeling weak. And Claire's not weak. She's not a weak character. She's not rubbish at jumping either. That's something she says. She's she's on a par with a lot of the other characters. But that insecurity um, hopefully kind of warms you to her and you're with her at the point where she realises she has that superpower. You feel excited because you want a nice thing to happen to that character who you kind of had a, not pity, but kind of a sensitivity towards. What's really interesting with Claire is in a lot of the reviews and the kind of the chatter about the game that happens online, people say that Claire is fat and that she's insecure about being fat. Um, which is really odd, because I, I never thought of Claire as fat. She's big because she has to carry characters later, that's the kind of a design concern. And at no point does the script mention her weight, or or even that she has a physical insecurity. Um, and that's kind of weird and odd, but it's also absolutely awesome, because if play so So exactly the same way as with John, I kind of really enjoyed the idea of introducing a swimming character and then having a level that you couldn't swim in. Um, so there's that, um, and me, just me being cheeky again, basically. Um, but the, the big lesson here is the idea of getting uh, Claire to carry another character. So there's one point right at the start of the level you have to get um, John to carry Claire. You have to, there's no way of completing the level without doing it. Um, which was cool, and, and kind of introduces that idea of carrying someone along. And then you've got an optional, uh, you can do it over the stepping stones straight after, uh, with Claire underneath and John on top. Surprisingly, a lot of players don't do that. I don't know if they don't see it, or they kind of, it just doesn't, they don't make that leap yet. Um, but hopefully that idea's been implanted, because that's very useful later on. <laughs> I said it was useful later on. It's actually it's useful immediately after, uh, which is this level, which is which is the payoff where you carry um, characters back and forth. Um, I also really like the whole um, the fox chicken grain logic puzzle, and it's kind of Thomas's little nod to that. Um, it's it's just something that people hopefully kind of will will work out and kind of start to see what Claire can do and start making um, start planning out with that ability in mind in later puzzles. This is probably the most showy level. This is kind of, this is epic. This is the one that always goes in the trailer. Um, <laughs> it's, yeah, I stole Rain from, um, uh, the, well, the method for doing Rain from uh, Quick Fingers, who's an awesome Unity dude who I'm now fortunate enough to work with. Um, and it's, it's cool, it's a big epic moment. Um, this is, uh, much like those falling platforms earlier on, this is kind of one of those big semi-scripted sequences because the pace is defined by the water, so therefore I know that if a player is surviving, they are playing through at a certain speed. Um, and it's cool, it, it also builds on the, the idea of carrying from earlier, um, but this time under pressure, so you have to move quicker and you, you haven't got time to think. Um, and if you try and get Thomas off of Claire, you're gonna have run into problems very quickly. So there's that as well. So it's hopefully kind of um, a nice way of, of solidifying all the learning the player's done about Claire up to this point. Was she more the lone Avenger type? Oh, if you'd like that. A sole hero in a world of rectangles and conveniently placed pools of toxic water. Steps. Um, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, in, on, on the upside, two things. One, I changed the shape of the steps. Um, which I feel kind of massively improves them. Um, <laughs> and two, I then sarcastically make a joke about steps in the script. Uh, so, so you can laugh with me at my uh, lack of design ideas up to this point. Why the world made it so difficult.
this is this is one of my favorite levels this what's nice about this level um is it breaks the thinking and learning you've done up to this point so up to this point i've been teaching you that claire is for carrying other characters um if i'd not done that this level would be a lot easier it's because you've been told to carry characters for every level up to this point your automatic reaction to a body of water is to jump Claire in and pile up all your characters, and that's not the solution. I love the fact that this puzzle kind of only exists in the head of the player, and it's great watching, uh, you know, Let's Plays and when I was doing playtesting and taking it to events and stuff, that you actually see people performing the action you've taught them to do of getting the characters on top of Claire and then realizing that's not the solution, that the solution is much simpler than they think. And it's, it's only a few places in the game I managed to pull that off, but I, I'm really, really happy with this one. Music. Uh, Dave, David came in, well actually he came in pretty early, basically the original Flash game had had no music and one of the biggest criticisms was that there was no music, there were no sound effects either. Um, so I had to get someone and I, I kind of fortunately found David through a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend um, and he did a cool little demo uh, which is now actually over the end credits and um, he was awesome, I got him in, he wrote this amazing piece of music for each kind of chapter of the game. Um, basically, the way we worked is I would I would send him kind of the the kind of the emotional script for the game of you know how the character's feeling, what's the the setup here, and he'd work from that and kind of build a piece of music. About halfway through development, I made his life a lot harder because I, I decided I wanted a like a randomised procedural system, so you'll never hear the game too obviously loop. They're basically little sequences of music that kind of get piled up in in, in interesting ways. And, and he was really good, he was really good with that. He split up what he'd already made and made it work, and then every track from that point on used that system really, really well. So he was really adaptive, and he's awesome. And he's like, he's like 14, well, he's not 14, but he's very young, and it fr frustrates me how talented he is. I, I had a really good time working with him, so thank you, David. So this is this is an attempt to do a puzzle with kind of multiple solutions. This again was one of the very early levels I made. Um, it was more of a kind of a test level originally, just to kind of check that all the uh, the characters were interacting correctly, and the platforms were working the way I wanted them to. And it's cool because everyone has a different way of doing it. There's lots of ways of you know optimally doing it, but then there's lots of ways of also doing it in kind of cool show-off ways, which is nice. It's a good chance actually to talk about the backgrounds. 
so the backgrounds i was going to do kind of you know much like the shadows i was kind of going to do specific bespoke level backgrounds and it was it was working all right it wasn't they didn't look great um mainly because i just wasn't spending enough time on them this is a hundred level game and i was it just wasn't working so in the end i did a kind of a procedural system so it's they're kind of they're freeze-framed particle effects so basically i i, I draw them all off from a batch of images place them at different parallax depths and, and just go with it so hopefully that kind of gives everything a nice texture and kind of the, i think it brings all the levels together and it means that every time you play a level it looks a bit different which is fun <laughs> This is where I introduce spikes. Um, I needed a hazard. Uh, well, I needed two things. I needed a hazard that only Claire, that Claire couldn't get past, so not water, basically something that she could get hurt by. Um, and I also needed a hazard I could put on ceilings. Um, I tried. I did actually try because it's all in the virtual world. I was like, oh well, it's fine. I'll have um, I'll have upside down water, and it looked rubbish, as as I'm sure you'd expect. Um, so the, the, so the spikes got added, um, I introduced them specifically just with Claire, just so you can, as a player, learn that Claire is, is, is actually going to be damaged by them, and it kind of just changes the relationship a little bit between Claire and the environment, and hopefully in a safe way. Um, this level's pretty, pretty straightforward. Her kryptonite. Not the rubbish red kryptonite either, the proper radioactive green stuff. versions of the commentary for this level uh, the first version is that from a narrative perspective i needed to establish that there was a uh, an intelligence to the system you're in that there were negative forces and i needed to disrupt the flow of play in order to make you aware that that was there so a glitch kind of made it made a lot of sense and it's kind of something the matrix does deja vu quite a bit to kind of show you that something's been changed and that was cool the um the other version and the more honest version was that i i i had a very very um near deadline in order to take the game to a festival and i hadn't i had to have another level i don't know why i'd set myself a, a, a an actual kind of level count no one was judging me or, or questioning me 29 levels would have been just as good as level as 30 levels but i did and this was a nice way of reusing that map once I'd made it, I kind of assumed I'd always remove it, but I, once I'd made it, I actually thought this was quite cool. And there's a few little tweaks, so um, the moving platform moves a little bit faster, and obviously Thomas is there. So I kind of liked actually reusing the same space with different characters as kind of a, a, a way of twisting a puzzle. I didn't want to do it too many times in the game, because I figured, you know, people would just feel I was being a bit, well, a bit cheeky and, and not making enough content. But it, it was a nice thing to just do once, and to, and to just see how that mixed things up. <laughs>
It's only <laughs> it's only as we record these that I'm realizing quite how much I played the, um, the the new character, but you can't use them properly yet. Card. Um, I do it all over the place. Um, so so in this in this moment, um, this is obviously Laura um, is introduced and deliberately separated out from Chris. Um, it's nice because it lets us kind of learn who Laura is before we start interacting with her, and kind of it gives some context to to what the interaction that she has with the characters later. Um, so that's hopefully quite fun. Uh, I, I do this far too much, and I need to not do this in, the, in future projects. Not as much. As long as he didn't find out what she could do, which would never happen so long as they stayed separate. Pixel clouds um, were something. They were something I worked on early on. It was it was one of those weird ones where I had the idea for it, kind of art-wise, before I actually kind of worked out how to use them in the game itself. So I thought it would be cool to have these big swirling kind of pixel shapes, um, and they look okay. So this level is again, it was a kind of a, a test level that I made um, that kind of later became something that, that that was actually really useful and interesting in the game. The, the point of this level really is just to get you used to the idea that, um, that that Laura changes people's jump heights. That's basically it. It's it's done earlier in the um, in the portal placement. Uh, you hopefully kind of half got it, but I just don't want to assume that you did. So here you have to actually kind of work out that that that, that bouncing actually kind of helps you uh, progress. Um, it's nice. It kind of gets you to learn it. It's safe. There's no threats. Um, and yeah, it's uh, it's cool. I liked it. I thought it was it was nice. Um, I also didn't realise actually at the point where I was making this level that Laura and Chris were a perfect match, and I kind of played with that a bit more as it went on. pixel cloud ever remains, looking a little bigger and a little less hungry with every disappearing friend. I, I struggled to work out different puzzles uh, involving Laura because basically she makes things jump higher. That's a, that's a limited kind of scope. Um, and one of the very kind of the cool ideas I had, I think, with Laura was specifically to keep her separate from the play space, so she couldn't interact directly with characters, but to have enough of her kind of poke out of a wall or be available to the other players that they could interact and get a benefit from her. And it allowed me to do things like this level, where you have kind of an indirect relationship spatially with um, between the two characters. Um, and I really like it, actually. I think it's it's kind of interesting. I, I, I'd have liked to have done a few more of these. Yeah. 